Well, let's get started uh, with our passage today. Someone asked a question that I get asked all the time, a question that I ask myself all the time too. Uh, in moments of trial and hardship, in times of trouble and suffering, is God even here with us? Has God abandoned us? Because it feels like we're all alone. It feels like our prayers just bounces back to us like echoes in an antechamber. When we ask that question, of course, our friends will quickly confirm, yes, God is with us. We just have to trust Him even when we can't see Him. Well, today I want to tell you that He's actually more than just present with us in times of trouble. He's more than that. So let's pray before we begin. Uh, Father, please be with us now. Work in us through the power of your Spirit. For the sake of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. If you remember from last week how easily the church in Corinth put up or tolerate the foolish boastings of the false teachers, well, to make this point, Paul did a little boasting himself, but he hates it so much because he knows it's foolish. So in a sarcastic or ironic way, he said, for example, in chapter 11, verse 1, I hope you will put up with me a little foolishness. Yes, please put up with me. Or in verse 17 of chapter 11, I'm not talking as the Lord would, but as a fool, he said. Or verse 18, since many are boasting in the way the world does, I too will boast. Or in verse 23, he said, I am out of my mind to talk like this. He keeps going on because he's making a point here. And remember, he's being ironic, he's being sarcastic. He wants to make an important point. But before we get to that point, he's going to do a bit more of this foolish boasting. And this time, with regards to visions and revelations. And so that brings us to our passage today. Chapter 12, verse 1. I must go on boasting. Although there's nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. Although there is nothing to be gained. Can you hear how exasperated he is? It's like he is saying, I can't believe I'm doing this. And then he starts talking about someone else. Have a look at verse 2 to 4 with me. Verse 2, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Now, that phrase, third heaven, is a reference to biblical cosmology in the first century. The dis distinction between the different levels of heaven is just a way to clarify what you mean when you say heaven, because that word can be a bit ambiguous. So in the first century, uh, they have a concept of the first, second, and third heaven. The first heaven is just the atmosphere, what we call the sky. The second heaven is outer space, where the moon and stars and the sun is. Uh, the, the third heaven is the spiritual, not physical, place where God dwells. And I stress that word spiritual there because it's not part of the physical universe. So you can't find it with a telescope, even if you try. When the Bible just says heaven, it can be ambiguous. It's quite a general word. So you can say the birds are flying in the heavens. We can also say at night we look to the heavens to see the stars. Or we can also say Jesus is now in heaven with God. Now, the context clarifies for us in each of those sentences. But here, Paul wants to make it super clear. He is specifying what he's talking about. This man was caught up to the third heaven. He didn't fly to the clouds or journey to Mars. He was caught up to this spiritual, not physical or material, the spiritual place where God dwells. Also in verse 4, he repeats it again. He used a parallel word, paradise. He was caught up to the very presence of God. He went where God lives. He, he gets to go to God's house. Can you imagine the amazing glory and power and majesty he experienced there? It was an incredible vision and revelation, and similar to what happened to the Apostle John, I suppose. Now, John was told to record everything he saw and heard, and that's why we have the book of Revelation. But this man, he had things no one is permitted to tell. It was a private revelation not to be shared with anyone else. Now, at this point, we're left wondering, who is this man? Who is he talking about? But as you read on, you sort of realize he's actually talking about himself in the third person. Because when you get to verse 7, he goes back to the first person. Now, why is he doing this? Why boot around the bush? Because he's trying to make a point. And that point is this, very simple. Visions and revelations are actually not worth boasting about, even when it's true. It's not a big deal. 
Now, if this has happened to the false teachers of Corinth, they would have been writing best-selling books about this. They would have milked it for all its worth and puffed themselves up. They would have started the church of Jesus Christ of the third heaven. They would have mentioned it every time they speak. They would be boasting about it at every opportunity. Oh, hey, thanks for inviting me to your home. Wow, this is a really sturdy door. It reminds me of the time I was caught up to the third heaven. Have I mentioned that to you? Oh, hey, bro, don't you just love the weather? It's so sunny these days. Hey, you know what's even brighter than the sun? Did I mention I was caught up to the third heaven? But Paul, he's different. He would rather boast about his weakness. Have a look at verse 5 with me. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth, but I refrain. So no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. See, he wants people to judge him by his conduct and his words, the way he lives his life, his actions, the message he preached. That's how he wants to be judged. That's how he wants to be measured. It's like what Kevin said last week, right? The true apostle is to be judged by his words, his message, his action. See, this is a really important point to get across. And it's not just what Paul thinks. It's not just his personal style. What he is doing here is consistent with what God is on about. Even God thinks that this is not worth boasting about. In fact, God took steps to ensure it. Now have a look with me at verse 7. Chapter 12, verse 7. To keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassingly great revelations, there was given to me a thought in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. To keep Paul from being conceited, to keep him from being puffed up then boastful to keep him from thinking that this is what it's all about he was given a thorn now we don't know what it was this thorn but we know it's torment for him it could have been an illness it could have been a specific suffering that he had to endure but whatever it was god gave it to him to humble him. But also there's another goal here. And we find out that goal because God said no to him. Uh, have a look with me. Chapter 12, verse 8. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Three times, Paul said, which is, if you remember, kind of, reminds you of Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, doesn't it? Remember what he said, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And Jesus prayed that three times, and God's answer to Jesus at the time was also no. And God's answer to Paul was the same. Friends, I wonder if God ever said no to you. When you prayed and prayed to take away your pain or your suffering or your thorn. I think God's answer to Paul is relevant to us here. You have to read on in verse 9, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest in me. God says, his grace is sufficient. God has given Paul everything he needed. It's enough. He doesn't need this thorn to be taken away. Because, see that word for, it's giving us the reason. The reason is, it's enough because God's power is made perfect in weakness. And that's not saying that God's power is somehow defective or, or it needs to be rectified. It's not like that. That word made perfect sort of has this meaning of 
reaching its fulfillment or being completed or achieving its goal. I like to translate it as the power of God is maxed out in weakness. Think about it this way. This amazing power uh, of God, the power of Christ, the power of uh, the resurrection, that power, the Bible tells us, is working inside us to achieve a goal. And the Bible has made it very clear what that goal is. That goal is to transform us, to transform us so that we become like Jesus. To, to make us more and more like Christ, to mature us. But not just that, it's working through us to do his will so that we become his instruments of righteousness to love the world he made and to proclaim the message of the gospel so people can be saved that is the power that is at work in us in us and through us and here's what this passage is saying the way that power completes its work in us surprisingly is through weakness it needs this ingredient of weakness for this power to complete its job. I know it seems counterintuitive, doesn't it? It's a bit like this, I just found out from the internet. It's a reputable YouTube channel that apparently being hungry and cold actually helps you live longer. It can reverse aging. I'll share the video with you if you want. But it's counterintuitive, isn't it? You, you, you think being hungry and being cold would make you age even more, but it's the other way around. So this is true as well with God's power achieving its goal, God's power being maxed out in our weakness. But I want you to know that we see this principle again and again in the Bible, the power of God being made perfect in weakness, the power of God shown most clearly in things and or in people who are seemingly weak. I'll give you an example. Christ came into the world as what? As a weak and powerless baby born in a smelly, dirty stable. But right there is the hope of the world, the birth of the king of the universe. Christ, he went to the cross, the most agonizing and shameful death. But that was the power of God to save a dying world. That was the glory of God. The message that Paul preached is Christ crucified. And he said himself in 1 Corinthians, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But that is the power of God and the wisdom of God that is able to snatch people from the jaws of hell. Look, it may seem counterintuitive, but God has always done this. In weakness, he has shown his greatest power and strength. It is in our weakness that we see the power of God mixed out in us. I see this all the time. People telling me how their faith had matured when they went through the most severe trial. And I know it's true for me too. You know, we took time off last week because it was the 10th birthday of our first daughter, Lizzie, who passed away eight years ago. A good friend of mine asked me, how do I feel now, eight years later? I described it as uh, living in a house with this deep hole in the ground, in the middle of the house, like right in the middle of the kitchen, for example. And you can't fix it, you can't fill it up. It's just there and over time, you just kind of learn to live around it. You put things around it to so make sure you don't fall in. It's, it's just there. It's part of living in that house. It's just there waiting for the day of the resurrection for that hole to be completely healed. See, to us, losing a child was the most severe trial that we've ever experienced. It's a thorn that tormented us, even still today. But the truth is, we saw the power of God maxed out through it. Through the tears and the doubts and the pains and the questions and the regret and the anger, God's power was shown most clearly. Otherwise, honestly, we wouldn't have survived it. But by His grace and His power, we did, we even matured that bit more. And God used us to bless others even. I suppose you can only see the rainbow when it rains. In weakness, God's power rests in me. 
That's what Paul says in verse 9. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. See, rather than boasting about being caught up in the third heaven, he boasts about his weakness. And you think Paul being caught up in the third heaven, the, the place where God dwells, that, that would be amazing, right? But you know what's more amazing? It's having Christ's power rest on Paul. See, that word rest is, is the word for taking up residence, to live, to, to dwell, to pitch a tent, to move in, really. Paul gladly boasts about his weakness so that Christ's power would move in and live in him to take up residence in him. So you don't need to be caught up to the third heaven to experience the perfected power of God. It is in our weakness that the maxed out power of God come and dwell in us. So to you who wonders today if God is present with you in your suffering or in your struggle or in your torment or in your thorn, the Bible does not just say he is present with you, he is there to comfort you, or he sees your tears or he knows your fears. The Bible doesn't just say that here in this verse, it tells us more than that. It tells us that the power of Christ, the power of Christ that is made perfect in weakness, the power of Christ that is maxed out, comes and pitches his tent in you. He comes and moves in to be with you in your weakness. That power to transform you, that power to sustain you in your faith, the power that gives you life, the power to mature you, the power to bless you, the power to keep you and strengthen you. It comes and dwells in you in your weakness as you walk through your deepest and darkest valleys. God is not just there standing on the sideline. His maxed out power comes and stays with you. You see why like having visions or being caught up to paradise is nothing compared to this. That is why in verse 10, Paul says, have a look at verse 10. For Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. See, many of our weaknesses and, and suffering, we don't get to choose ourselves we don't get to say yes or no we experience them it just comes to us because we live in a broken world and, and we are broken people too but sometimes we get to choose we get to choose to suffer and endure insult and hardship and persecution and difficulties like like Paul here he chose to suffer in fact he says here he delights in them he makes that choice to suffer but not for the sake of suffering He's not a masochist who just loves to suffer. No, he tells us here it is for the sake of Christ that he does this. It is for the sake of proclaiming Jesus to the ends of the world that he chose to suffer. It is for the sake of glorifying Christ and making him great that Paul chose to suffer. In fact, he delights in them. Another translation says he is content with them. He accepts them because in our weakness, we have great strength that comes from the maxed out power of Christ in us. One night, I was chatting with Micah about death and I, and I told him, yes, death is scary and it's horrible, but, but we trust and we follow Jesus. That's why we don't need to be afraid. We can have hope because we will rise from the dead. We will live forever with God because Jesus rose from the dead. So what happens to people who don't trust and follow Jesus, he, he asked me. And, and I said to him, well, those things won't happen for them. And I can see the gears in his head kind of turning. So I, I, I had to add, and I, I tell him, that's why we want to tell people about Jesus. So they too can trust and follow Jesus. So they too can experience life with God forever. 
like your friends at school, you know, some of them don't trust anthology, so you need to go and tell them too. And then, to my great surprise, he said, Daddy, I'm going to start a Bible club at school. We can read the Bible together and tell people who come about Jesus. Now, you would think at that moment I would be filled with pride, but you would be totally wrong. Now, I'm showing you my sinfulness here. I actually felt scared for him. It caught me so much by surprise, I didn't know what to say. I was scared. I was scared he would be rejected. He'd be there all alone at school holding his Bible with no one wanting to join his Bible club. I was scared that he'd get picked on or that he won't have any friends anymore. No one would want to play with him because he's the kid who started the Bible club that no one wanted to join. So he never experienced what it feels like being rejected by people when you want to tell them about Jesus. He doesn't know that the work of telling people about Jesus will invite trouble and persecution and insult and hardship. And I was scared for him. I'd willingly go through that. But this is my son. If you've done it before, you know it. And, and that's why I suppose we all kind of have that feeling of fear. The fear of rejection, of being the odd one out. So that evening, and for the next day, I came to God and I just prayed, Oh God, please, please don't make it hard for him. And then I went through this passage to prepare for this sermon. And there it was in the last verse. Paul choosing, in fact, delighting, being content. All that hardship, he, he chose to take them on because Christ's power is maxed out in all of that suffering. In fact, that maxed out power of Christ comes and lives in him. So no wonder Paul says it's okay that he would be content with them. Because in our weakness, God's strength is with us, and that makes us strong. And as I consider this, and I realize if I want the best for my son, there is nothing better than the maxed out power of Christ living in him, doing its work in him. So I, I, so I let him choose to do this. I, I sent him off that morning with this book, this pretty awesome book, Everything a Child Should Know About God. And off he goes. Off he goes to start his Bible course. I suppose we all should do that too. Let's pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for the Lord Jesus who died and rose again for us, whose power is real in us. And thank you for the reminder today that even in our trouble and trial and suffering and hardship, not only are you present with us, your power is maxed out in us because it is in weakness that you are at work the most. That your power is made perfect, that you are doing what you aim for us, what you want for us, what you've always destined us to be. You are doing that. And so help us to trust you in times of sorrow and weakness and grief and hardship that you're there doing your work. And not only that, you've come even more clearly. And so help us, Lord, to keep holding on to the strength that you give us, that your grace is sufficient for us, even in these times. Help us trust you more. Help us hold on to you even more. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.